Hello, welcome back. So in today's video, I'll be talking about how to know exactly if a stock is overvalued. So in today's video, we'll be covering a few things. We'll be covering how exactly to value a stock, as well as some questions that you guys have left me in the comment section below. So let's talk about the simple ratios that you can use for valuation first. And the first one is the simple PE ratio. So your PE ratio is simply just your price of the stock divided by the earnings of the company. So the higher the PE ratio, the more expensive the company is. The lower the PE ratio, the cheaper the company is. Next one is your PEG ratio. So your PEG ratio is normally used for high growth companies to justify the high PE ratio. So basically what you do is you take the PE ratio that was calculated from the previous portion and then you divide that by the EPS growth rate of the company. So typically for stocks, the fair value for the PEG is around a 2 to a 2.5 times. So if a company has a PEG ratio that is lower than 2 or 2.5 times, then the company is generally considered undervalued. If a stock has a PEG ratio of upwards of 2.5 times, then the stock is overvalued. The next valuation method is your price to sales method. So for your price to sales, what you're doing is you're taking the price of the company, the market cap of the company, and then you divide it by the annual sales that the company makes. So for price to sales ratio, normally you use it for companies that are not profitable yet. People normally use this valuation to justify high valuations for highly speculative stocks. And that's why I usually avoid this metric. Next one is price to book. So price to book is basically the market cap of the company divided by the book value of the company. So your book value is basically the net worth of the company. You can think of it as sort of like the net worth because it is your asset minus your liabilities. So for your price to book ratio, normally you use it for commodities, for real estate, for banks, all these different industries and for companies with hard assets as well. So the other method that you can use to calculate the valuation of a company and to determine whether or not the stock is undervalued is to use this ROIC and growth calculation method to find your justified PE ratio. So the higher your ROIC and the higher your growth rate, the higher the justified PE ratio for the company. So basically if the company's PE ratio is below the justified PE ratio, then the company is undervalued. If the company has a PE ratio that is above the justified PE ratio, then the company is overvalued. This is another way of finding out whether or not a stock is overvalued. So besides all those ratios, let's talk about the holy grail of valuation, which is your discounted cash flow analysis. And this is what Warren Buffett said about the discounted cash flow analysis. I got two short questions. One is how do you find intrinsic value in a company? Well, intrinsic value is what is the number that if you were all knowing about the future and could predict all the cash that a, a business would give you between now and Judgment Day, discounted at the proper discount rate, that number is what the intrinsic value of a business is. In other words, the only reason for making an investment and laying out money now is to get more money later on, right? That's, that's what investing is all about. Now, when you look at a stock, when you look at a bond, so means the United States government, it's very easy to tell them what you're going to get back. It says it right on the bond. It says when you get the interest payments. It says when you get the principal. So it's very easy to figure out the value of a bond. It can change tomorrow if interest rates change. But you are the cash flows are printed on the bond. The cash flows aren't printed on a stock certificate. That's the job of the analyst is to print out, change that stock certificate, which represents an interest in the business, and change that into a bond and say, this is what I think it's going to pay out in the future. When we buy, you know, some new machine for Shaw to make carpet, that's what we're thinking about, obviously. And you, you all learn that in business school. But it's the same thing for a big business. It, it, if you buy Coca-Cola today, the company is selling for about 110 to $15 billion in the market. The question is, if you had 110 or $15 billion, you wouldn't be listening to me, but uh, <laughs> I'd be listening to you, incidentally. Uh, but the question is, would you lay it out today to get what the Coca-Cola company is going to deliver to you over the next two or three hundred years. The discount rate doesn't make much difference after uh, as you get further out. But, and that is a question of how much cash they're going to give you. It isn't a question of, you know, it isn't a question of how many analysts are going to recommend it or what the volume in the stock is or what the chart looks like or anything. It's a question of how much cash it's going to give you. And that's the only reason. It's a true if you're buying a farm. It's true if you're buying an apartment house. Any financial asset, oil in the ground, you're laying out cash now to get more cash back later on. And the question is, is how much are you going to get? When are you going to get it? And how sure are you? And when I calculate intrinsic value of a business, when we buy businesses, and whether we're buying all of a business or a little piece of a business, I always think we're buying the whole business because that's my approach to it. I look at it and say, what, what will come out of this business and when? And 
what you really like, of course, is them to be able to use the money they earn and earn higher returns on it as you go along. I mean, Berkshire has never distributed anything to its shareholders, but its ability to distribute goes up as the value of the businesses we own increases. We can compound it internally, but the real question is, Berkshire selling for, we'll say, 105 or so billion now, uh, what can we distribute from that 100, if you're gonna buy the whole company for 105 billion now, can we distribute enough cash to you soon enough to make it sensible at present interest rates to lay out that cash now? And that's, that's what it gets down to. And if, the, if you can't answer that question, you can't buy the stock. Okay, so your discounted cash flow analysis is basically the net present value of all your future free cash flows. So what you do is you take the free cash flow of the company from now to judgment day as Warren Buffett said, and then you discount all those cash flows to today's present value. So for discounted cash flow analysis, there are a few things that you need to take note of. So the first one is your growth rate of your company. So it is a key component of your DCF and you need to be able to forecast a company's growth rate for the next five to 10 years at least. So the longer the duration from today's time, the harder it is to forecast the earnings and the growth for the company. And that's why typically when you forecast long durations, you want to have a lower growth rate towards the tail end of your predictions. And then the next component of your discounted cash flow is your discount rate. So imagine you lend your friend $100. You will probably ask him for an additional $5 back when he returns you the money because you are number one, taking on time risk. And number two, you're taking on the risk of lending him the money as well. So it is the same thing for investments. You want something called a discount rate or required rate of return. And what affects your discount rate? So number one, the higher the risk, the higher the return that you want from this business. So the higher the risk of the company, the higher the discount rate that you want from the company. And also the higher the 10 year bond yield, the higher the discount rate due to opportunity cost as well. So another important component of your discounted cash flow analysis is your terminal growth rate. So generally for a terminal growth rate, what you want to put it at is between 2.5 and 3%, basically in line with GDP. But for more predictable businesses, what you can do is you can increase the terminal growth rate for these businesses because they'll be able to defend the share over time and that will increase the intrinsic value of the business as well. So let's take a look at how exactly you can find the free cash flow of a business. So to find the free cash flow of the business, what you need to take note of are just two lines. So number one, take note of this line, which is your net cash provided by operating activities. So take this value over here, which is 19,950, and then take away this portion, which is your purchase of property, plant and equipment. That portion is basically the capex of the business. So free cash flow in simple terms is just your operating cash flow minus your capex. So take the 19,950 and then take away this 1,257, and then you will get the free cash flow for the business itself. So let's take a look at a live example of a company's discounted cash flow analysis. I'll be doing Visa's analysis. So this is Visa's trailing 12 month free cash flow. It's around $20 billion. So assuming this company grows at 11%, with a 3% terminal growth rate, this company's fair value is at around $274 a share. But for predictable businesses, what you can do is you can increase the terminal growth rate for these businesses because they'll be able to predictably grow after this 10 years has passed. So for Visa, maybe you can put it at upwards of 4% or even 5% or so. And clearly, as you can see, Visa's fair value at a 4% terminal growth rate will be at around $300 a share. So this is Visa's fair value based on this discounted cash flow analysis. And there's another method that you can use as well to value a company. Basically, it's the EPS calculation. So in this EPS calculation, what you are trying to do is you're trying to forecast how fast a company can grow and assign a terminal multiple to it at the end of those five years. So for Visa right now, the EPS is at $9.80. And assuming this company grows its EPS at around 13%, because they normally grow earnings at around 11%. And if you're to add in the buybacks as well, this company will likely achieve a 13% EPS growth. So assuming a 13% EPS growth for this company, the next thing that you need to input is the terminal multiple for this business. So for a terminal multiple, there are a few approaches that you can take. You can find the average PE of this company. So for Visa, the median PE is at around 32 times. You can compare the PE ratio. So for Visa and MasterCard, the average PE ratio is at around 35 times. Or you can take the sector PE, which is at around 25 times in the financial sector. So for Visa, it is a high quality predictable business. And that's why I think a 28 times multiple for Visa is more than reasonable. In fact, in 2022, the lowest point where it dropped to was around the 27 times. So I'm taking that value over there. And with the stock price today of around $350 and with the dividend yield over here, this company will give you an 8% return over the next few years. So typically for your required rate of return, you want at least 10% return. So 8% return means that the company is overvalued today. So for Visa, it is a stock that is currently overvalued. So next portion, I'll be talking about some questions that you guys have left me in the comment section below. So the first one is, hey, would be interested to hear your thoughts on DAC. Thank you. 
So DAC is a company that is down 50% year to date, is the biggest S&P 500 loser this year. And currently now the stock is trading at around 16 times earnings. So for DAC, what they do is they sell shoes. But the problem with the business itself is it faces a lot of competition in that space. So you have companies like Nike, you have companies like Adidas, New Balance, even Anta in China as well. All these different shoe brands competing for the same pie. And that's why I think this industry, which is your footwear industry, is normally an avoid. If you're seriously interested in a footwear industry, I think another company in China itself, Anta Sport, is a lot more predictable as compared to all these different American companies. Because in China, you only have two big players. You have Leaning as well as Anta Sport only. And Nike's presence there isn't as large as compared to outside of China. So for Deckers, it's a company that is operating in a very competitive segment. And that's why it's in a void. The company is trading at a decent valuation. But if you are to compare this to Crocs, Crocs has always traded at less than 10 times of earnings. So for Deckers, it's trading at 16 times earnings. It looks cheap compared to its peers like Nike and so on. But if you are to compare that to Crocs itself, the stock still looks expensive. So for me, this stock is in a void. Next comments over here is for LVMH. So the first comment it says, the alcohol segment is facing headwinds as well. Gen Z is drinking less and the China slowdown is not a small matter. Furthermore, they're not true luxury like Hermes, which doesn't advertise as it would cheapen their brand image. So the other comment also says, LVMH seems to be trading at an attractive valuation right now, but its past years of share value has been quite flat. Your previous analysis suggests that it could generate a good return, but it seems that the share price is not catching up with its fundamentals. So for LVMH, yes, they have a portion of the business that is in wines and spirits, around 8% of the revenue. And yes, Gen Z is drinking a lot lesser. So the China slowdown is also a problem for the business itself. That one is almost impossible for you to go and measure. But if you are to take a trip down to China itself, I don't think anything has changed over there. I mean, you're seeing a lot of things online about China manufacturers mocking LVMH. But overall, the Chinese consumers are still buying these luxury goods. I mean, LVMH's biggest consumer base is still the Chinese over there. And last year alone, a lot of Japan's growth was actually from Chinese citizens. So this Chinese slowdown is tough for the business. But overall, I think the business is still resilient. Last year, it was quite resilient. And this year, I expect it to be a transition year for this company as well. As for the share price not catching up with its fundamentals, fundamentals have been dropping over the past two years. And from a valuation standpoint, the stock has actually dropped a lot more than the fundamentals itself. So yes, this could be an overreaction from the market itself, but the stock has been following its fundamentals and it has been going down over the past few years. So we have to see if LVMH can turn this one around. Next question it says, can you look into defensive stocks like Lockheed Martin and RTX due to the Iran-Israel war? So for your defensive stocks like Lockheed Martin and RTX, the problem is your defense companies, they are very complex. So they have government contracts, they have war breakouts affecting their businesses as well. And the competition in that space is almost unknown. So unless you're in the industry and you know how it works, it's usually an avoid. So buying because of a war is trading. If you want to invest, you should be buying a company based off its fundamentals itself. Of course, this war could have a tailwind for all these businesses. But events like this shouldn't be influencing you into buying all these stocks. I hope you guys have found this one useful and invest safe.